Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 105 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another terrific interview episode where we pull up a seat with the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world and try to absorb some of the wisdom they have to offer. This time around, we chat with Eric Zandona, Director of Spirits Information at the American Distilling Institute and author of several spirited books, including The Bourbon Bible and an exciting new publication entitled The Tequila Dictionary. This is the third and final installment of our little mini-series on contemporary trends in agave spirits. So if you enjoy this interview, you may also want to go back and check out our recent episodes with Max and Eli of the Baltimore Spirits Company and with R.B. Wolfensberger of Gray Wolf Craft Distilling. But before you go back and listen to those, why don't you hang around here just long enough to make yourself a drink? This week's featured cocktail is the all-powerful margarita. Undoubtedly the queen of the tequila cocktail landscape, this tart, refreshing mixed drink has a reputation for being many things. You can find it on almost every chain restaurant or hotel bar menu. You can order a pitcher full of it at most Mexican restaurants, but the question remains, what separates a good margarita from a disappointing one? To answer that question, let's look at the ingredients. If you'd like to make yourself a really nice margarita, you'll need two ounces of tequila, one ounce of fresh lime juice, and three quarters of an ounce of orange liqueur. Combine these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, shake vigorously until it's cold as heck, and then strain into a stemmed cocktail glass or a rocks glass. You got a lot of flexibility in the glassware when it comes to the margarita. The traditional garnish for this drink is a lime wheel and a salt rim. So if you think your margarita could benefit from just a little bit of salinity, I'd say definitely go for it. I like the margarita for the same reason I like a classic daiquiri. These simple, refreshing drinks really let the spirit shine through. In the margarita's case, this means you can have a lot of fun using different types of tequila, like a silver versus a reposado or an añejo, right? Put a little barrel age on it and see how it works. Also, there's a lot of variation between different orange liqueurs out there, whether you're talking about triple sec, Cointreau, or Grand Marnier. So here's my challenge to you. Next time you go out for margarita supplies, really think about what you like in this drink. Think about what types of flavors you'd like to shine through and then pick up the specific products that you can use to make your house margarita. With a little practice, you're gonna have something your friends and family are gonna request again and again. And the fun part is that when you do that, you're able to put your own fingerprint on one of the world's most important and iconic cocktails. So now that you're all fueled up and salt rimmed, Let's turn our attention back to this stimulating interview with spirits author and judge Eric Zandona. Some of the subjects we discuss in this interview include what it's like to create a reference book like a dictionary or encyclopedia in the spirits world and how the tequila dictionary can be used as a tool by agave enthusiasts. How tequila and mezcal are different We give you the big picture overview, then we look into some historical trends and trace these spirits back through the decades. Which label terms and quality indicators you can use to make informed tequila and mezcal purchases next time you take a trip to the liquor store. How technology and commercial interests have prompted a number of changes in the way agave spirits are both manufactured and then consumed here on the other side of the border in the U.S. What emerging trends we can expect from tequila, mezcal, and agave cocktails in the coming years, and much, much more. 
You can learn more about Eric and his work by visiting ezdrinking.com. You can follow him at ezdrinking on Instagram and Twitter, and you can purchase your copy of the Tequila Dictionary wherever books are sold. And with that, it's my pleasure to present this South of the Border Spirits and Cocktail Conversation with author and spirits judge Eric Zandona. Eric, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Can you introduce yourself for our listeners, give them a little bit of background on who you are, what you do, and uh, I guess how you came to write this tequila dictionary? Yeah. So um, I work for an organization called the American Distilling Institute, which is a, a trade association for small distillers around the country. And so I've been uh, working with them for the last seven, eight years and uh, writing about spirits. And I now run their spirits competition, the Judging of Craft Spirits. And um, and so I've been just in the spirits world for a while now, really enjoy it and have been you know, writing about all sorts of spirits. And the publisher of the book approached me because they knew I was living in Oaxaca at the time with my family in southern Mexico. And um, I had done another project with them about bourbon, uh, which went really well. And so they asked me if they thought I could uh, do a dictionary for them about tequila. I was like, yeah, I love tequila. I love mezcal. There's quite a bit that I know and there's quite a bit that I was, you know, willing to to look into to find out. And so that's so that was sort of the sort of genesis of the project. And uh, I think it's turned out really well. Yeah. I, and you know what? It, I think Oaxaca is a really great place for us to start because having having been down there and having really immerse yourself in, in both the culture and the, the tasting of tequila. I was wondering if, if we might start by having you just paint a little bit of a picture of what it's like to live down there and, and experience the spirit in, I guess, its native habitat. Yeah. So, you know, I, before moving down there, I had, you know, obviously had uh, a bit of tequila and mezcal I was living in San Francisco and there were a number of bars that were dedicated to uh, mezcal. Of course, there's Tommy's Mexican restaurant, which is dedicated to tequila and agave spirits. And so there were lots of opportunities to, you know, sort of explore and discover the spirit from the bottle. But being down in Oaxaca added a whole nother sort of layer to sort of the understanding of it. And other people have talked about this, but being down in Oaxaca, you get the real sense of how integrated mezcal is to the culture of southern Mexico and, well, of Mexico sort of broadly, in that my sort of revelation that I had while I was down there was that mezcal is the vin de tabla that you would find in Italy or France, right? It's just there. It's not anything that people are sort of really highly focused on or, you know, spend a great deal of time with because it's just part of everyday life um, out in the countryside. Now, obviously, in Oaxaca City, there are bars dedicated to it for locals and for tourists, and and that's sort of a, a sort of slightly different thing. But out in the countryside, in the Pueblos, you know, you have mezcal at a party just like you have coffee and water and beer. It's just what you have. And that was really sort of fascinating to me because coming from San Francisco, the sort of the scarcity of and the sort of mystery of mezcal sort of has this creates a sort of presence and this sort of aura about it that can get very sort of um, special. And But there, it's not sort of treated that way in the same way. They value it, you know, especially when you talk to people in the industry, you know, there are issues around sustainability and the plants and, you know, deforestation and all those sorts of issues that people are concerned about. But in the, in the, in the little towns, 
you know, it's just part of everyday life. And that was that was really sort of fascinating to see while I was there. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I'm, I'm wondering if if you can explain to our listeners a couple things about the tequila dictionary uh, while I kind of process what you just said. Because as you and I were discussing off the air just a moment ago, there are very few reference books in the spirits and cocktail world relative to the other types of books. And here I'm thinking about recipe books and history books primarily. So maybe give us the the project of the tequila dictionary, the constraints you set for yourself of like what you were going to include and what you were not going to include. Just kind of give us a, a way to think about this book as it, as it, kind of applies to the utility factor and, and the discovery factor of like what people will discover with it. Yeah. So the fun thing about the structure in terms of having it be in a reference format is the way I see the book is sort of a choose your own adventure kind of approach to learning about tequila and mezcal and, and agave spirits. And so the, the structure of the book is that we include or I included materials on um, the individual spirits. So there are particular brands that are listed, but then there's information about the plant that where it comes from. So about agave uh, and the different parts of the plant. And there's information about how it's uh, harvested and how it's cooked and how it's fermented and distilled. And so all the different sort of aspects of how, you know, this plant that is native to southern Mexico and grows throughout uh, up into the, the U.S. Southwest, how this plant sort of can be transformed into this wonderful spirit. And, and then how it's consumed in cocktails and even a little bit about how it's been, how it's impacted culture. I wanted to kind of cover all of those aspects, but breaking them down into individual sort of you know, uh, items or definitions that somebody might look up allows the reader to sort of access the information that they're most curious about. You know, what is, you know, what, what are some tequila cocktails? Well, you can find those. What, how is, you know, tequila cooked? Well, you can find information about that. Or how is it, you know, fermented compared to, how mezcal is fermented. That information is in there. And there are little references sprinkled throughout the book. For each definition, it says something, you know, like on the side, there'll be a little reference like, well, if you're interested in this, like here are some other words that you might be interested in learning more about. And you can use that as a, a way to bounce through the book um, and, you know, discover, you know, information about this great spirit. Yeah, and as it occurs to me as well, right, uh, for, for somebody who is a, a beginner enthusiast in the agave spirits world, you know, you're inevitably going to come across a term, whether that's on a label or on a menu or, you know, offhand from a conversation that you're just not familiar with. And I, I see great value in just being able to flip open to that term and, and get a really robust or at least a, a basic sense of what it means so that you can kind of process what that means. And I, I can totally see myself walking up to the tequila and mezcal shelf at a really well-stocked liquor store with this book in hand and kind of using it as a way for me to make more informed purchases than I might otherwise do. Right, right. And it's interesting because even though, you know, the U.S. is the largest consumer of agave spirits in the world, um, the spirit obviously is native to Mexico. And so most of the terminology around tequila and mezcal are uh, in Spanish or they're adaptations of even indigenous languages in Mexico. And so for in for native English speakers like some of the terminology can be, you know, it's not readily understandable. Like, what does penca mean? What does reposado mean? What are these terms that people are referring to? Um, and so, you know, there's that are less clear than, say, like oven or autoclave or still, 
right? Those are kind of already in the sort of, you know, English lexicon that are understandable for people who, who know a little bit about spirits. But there are others that are, are, you know, in their sort of native setting. And so I, I really wanted to make sure that I had plenty of those um, Spanish words um, and sort of native uh, words that are adopt, adapted into the production process of tequila and agave as spirits in mezcal so that, you know, readers can understand what it is that they're seeing when they're looking at a label. Right. And I kind of see this as almost like a pointillism project where you're taking a bunch of little individual dots or pixels or information points and creating a much larger picture with it. So, you know, yes, it's it's definitely super useful for those of us who don't have a, a background in the Spanish language to be able to define those Spanish language terms. But then, of course, you take those common terms like still, for example, and you pass it through the filter of tequila and mezcal. So we're not getting a definition of what a still is. I mean, in general, yes, yes, we're getting that, but we're also getting a little bit more information about how specifically stills or ovens are approached in the production of these agave spirits. So, so I really like the reference guide being passed through this very specific filter of tequila and mezcal. So I, I really appreciate the way that you went about constructing it. And to me, it's, it's not only useful, but it's, it's also creative and, and captivating of the imagination. And the, the one other comment that I, that I had kind of flipping through the sections, and I, I wanted to give this, this little core sample, so to speak, to our listeners out there to explain what you can get in sequence um, when you just flip open to a random page on this book. Um, and I'll preface this by saying that I'm a huge fan of the show um, The Office. And mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there's there's one intro, which is my favorite like little intro uh, prank, where Jim comes in, he's dressed all uh, like Dwight, who's the one of the main kind of comic antagonists, if you haven't seen the show. And uh, eventually they get into this big, you know, kind of battle because he's impersonating Dwight and, and he ends up saying bears beats Battlestar Galactica. And, and it's just one of the, for me, out of context, it's not that funny, but to me, it's one of the funniest moments in the show. And I, I remember flipping to one set of pages in the tequila dictionary and you have three terms in a row that go bats, barrels, Beam Suntory. And it just, it just from, it reminded me of, of Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. And, and it's just so funny that you have bats, right? And, and initially it's like, well, what do bats have to do with tequila? And then we start getting into the kind of like their, their role as key pollinators in some cases. And then, of course, barrels, you know, another very generic word that we kind of all associate with spirits. And, and, you know, you get a little bit more in depth there. And then we get, Beam Suntory, which for people who are not in the spirits industry is going to be something that is really probably not all that familiar. And you kind of explain the presence of this uh, large international spirits conglomerate in mm -hmm. the in the world. So I, I love that little kind of core sample as a representation of what people can expect to find in this book. And I guess it leads me to something that you've mentioned before a couple minutes ago about including these key brands. Now, mm -hmm. this this is something that I haven't seen really um, all that often in this type of project. So can you talk a little bit about why you chose to do that and, and what value the, the inclusion of these brands brings to the Tequila Dictionary? Yeah, so for me, you know, the spirits ultimately are about beverages that we drink and enjoy. And so to that end, I always like to relate the information about the spirits to the actual products that people might be seeing on the shelf. And so that's why I wanted to include brands in the dictionary itself so that people could get a sense of like, oh, yeah, I know I've seen this bottle on the liquor shelf before at my local store or on the back bar. Um, but then they now they have a little bit more information about what that is and they can make some informed decisions about how they're drinking and what they're drinking by including them in, in the book. 
Right. And I mean, I, I guess for me, uh, you can kind of tell a little bit about a bottle by not only the label art, uh, the brand name, the the type and size of the bottle compared to the other bottles that are there on the shelves. I'm, I'm wondering if for our listeners who might be interested in expanding or making really well informed decisions about how to purchase or how to how to how to make really high bang for your buck purchases in the tequila or mezcal world. I don't necessarily think this would be the great time to be dropping um, brand names because you, you you do list a lot of these brands in the book. But are there any yeah. general principles that you follow when you're purchasing or evaluating the price point on a bottle of tequila or mezcal? Yeah. So for me, I, I for tequila, I'm particularly interested in how is the agave cooked. That to me is one is sort of the baseline of what the cost associated with production is that they're putting into it. Are they trying to make a product as cheaply as possible, or they're taking their time and being more labor intensive to get the best spirit that they can? So to me, how the agaves are cooked is a starting point for or a an identifier of like, okay, this is something to look at. Maybe I need to try that. And then I can see the, the pricing that goes along with that. And then if it's, if it's, uh, really an expensive product that uses the cheapest form of production, well, then that tells me something about the producer and the, the intent behind the brand. So for me, I'm looking like for my own personal taste, I'm looking mostly for, Tequilas that are cooked in ovens above ground that you that usually takes quite a while. It's a few days worth of cooking time with indirect heat. And that process breaks down the the inulin, which is a soluble fiber inside the plant uh, into fermentable sugars, which then get fermented and then distilled into alcohol and then distilled into tequila. And so that process, which is uh, the most sort of traditional way of making uh, tequila as we know it, I think results in the, the highest quality. Now, obviously, there can be other parts along that path that make one tequila that's cooked using cooked agaves from ovens better than others. And there are other factors, obviously, but that's a good starting point for me that I'm always looking at. And so I kind of go into different cooking methods, which for tequila are primarily above ground ovens, autoclaves, which are basically giant pressure cookers, and then a, a newer technology called diffusers, which are highly efficient, but there's actually no cooking involved in the process. And so you miss out on some of the traditional sort of flavor characteristics that you get from the process of actually heating up the, the plant fibers and, and using that heat as a pro and steam as a process to convert the soluble fiber into fermentable sugars. Right. And you would expect that there would be some sort of plant equivalent of the Maillard reaction, right? The caramelization uh, of some of these, um, some of the, the compounds as they actually get exposed directly to that heat. So that, that makes sense. Um, but I'm wondering if there are any uh, label terms that people can look for to indicate this or if what they really need to be doing is, of course, you know, referencing your publication uh, then, but also, you know, kind of diving into more online resources to figure out which of these brands are, are cooking in, in which ways. Yeah, so it used to be that um, the label, if you saw on the label 100% uh, de agave or 100% agave tequila or something along that line, that used to be a really good indicator of, okay, these are going to be sort of the higher quality products that I want to start with. Um, but that term has become insufficient in the, the contemporary period because of the introduction of the diffuser. So the diffuser technology is a is basically a machine that processes uh, tequila or processes agaves 
into um, into tequila, uh, into the fermentable sugars, which then get fermented and distilled into tequila without the cooking process. And so you can still have a 100% agave tequila now that's made in a very different way with very different flavor profiles from those that are cooked in a traditional oven. And so, unfortunately, there's not a lot of required labeling that can give you that information. So I rely on a few different resources online um, and then just reading about what brands are doing. Sometimes they'll tell you on their label, like, oh, it was cooked in an oven or they used a tahona to crush the agaves which means they used a big wheel to, to crush them. If they're using a Tahona, that's also that's a good sign that they're interested in traditional production processes that are uh, focused on flavor. And most brands that use Tahonas like to like to tell you that. So um, you'll find that usually somewhere on their label. But um, unfortunately, they're unlike bourbon, say, or some or some other spirits. Um, there's not as much mandatory labeling information for tequila to really kind of give you a breakdown of where these 100% agave spirits sort of sit in the market in terms of production. Right, right. And that's something that we also experience in other categories, right? Like rums uh, in yeah, particular. Rum is a great example. Yeah. So, well, a couple things. Uh, regarding your comments on the Tahona, I, I like that as a little indicator because it would be completely outlandish to picture a uh, tequila producer going through the manual labor and the, the kind of old fashioned production methods of crushing things with a giant wheel and then just, right. and then just, uh, you know, turning around and using the most up to date kind of diffusion, diffuser technology. It seems like it's a, a complete mismatch. So I, I like that as an indicator. Uh, and then when it comes to, you know, the lack of labeling regulations, I guess it, it does present a problem for consumers and, and it does seem like the best solution is really just education on, on the individual basis. But yeah. to me, that almost makes the discovery of a brand, especially if you can discover it at a good price point, right? Uh, it makes yeah. it almost exhilarating. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, I mean, the, the great thing is there is one really fantastic resource that tequila has that other spirits don't. And that's the inclusion of the NOM, N-O-M number on all the labels. And most tequila brands come from a much smaller number of distilleries in Jalisco. So while there's thousands of brands, there's only a few hundred distilleries. And so you can link back this number it's on the label back to where it's made. And you'll often find that there are multiple tequilas out in the market from the same place that sit on the shelf at very different uh, price points. And so with some digging, uh, there are some good resources online where you can you can tie back that number to the actual production facility and then find out what other products are made there. And you can get a sense of, oh, I like this product. It comes from this place, but they also make this other thing. And this is maybe a little bit more affordable or maybe it's a little bit more expensive. And so you can, and not, it's not to say that necessarily all of those spirits are exactly the same. They're not, but they're in the same ballpark. If there's something you like about that particular product in terms of its flavor profile, another spirit from that same producer is going to probably have those same characteristics and you can, you know, inform your purchasing around some of that. That is such a great little like nugget that you can take to the internet and, and just, you know, just get some really great results out of that. I really like that. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about how you see tequila on the market today and maybe projections for what might what people can maybe expect from the category in the next couple of years. But one thing I'd, I'd like to do before we do that is talk a little bit about how you see 
tequila versus mezcal. Now, we've had a couple of episodes where we speak in depth about the production methods and, and about what it what American agave means. Actually, those were just a couple of episodes ago. So this is this is coming in at a really great time in the podcast. But since you're coming at agave spirits from a, a very overarching kind of zoomed out level with all these different terms, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you might be able to talk about the distinctions that you see you don't have to get into like every little thing. We don't have to start talking about Bacanora and all of the, the individual plants, but but in general, tequila and mezcal in terms of production, in terms of what people are looking for out of a bottle, what do you see as the, the big distinguishers? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I point out in the book is that, you know, mezcal is basically the generic name for agave spirits in, Me in Mexico. And until more recent times, I think it was in the 1880s, that tequila began to distinguish itself from mezcals made in other parts of Mexico. And for a, for a while, you know, people would refer to it as mezcal de tequila, and then eventually the mezcal part just dropped off and people just referred to it as tequila. And so to me, you know, I see these spirits as basically the same thing, which they are, and that they're all made from agave. Um, but different traditions and production practices sort of inform their flavor profiles. And so that's sort of, it's a technological differentiation uh, really, that that kind of makes them different at this point. The innovation of above ground ovens, which used indirect heat for cooking agaves, was the was the big factor that branched tequila off from what we know of mezcal as it is today, in terms of a more smoky um, spirit that that has a lot of depth of character from sort of uh, you know being fermented with wild yeast and on the fiber and, you know, sometimes distilled in clay pots or uh, there's all sorts of, you know, sort of more traditional practices going on in Mezcal, both in Oaxaca and other surrounding states that are allowed to, to, to use that, that name now. So those are, that's sort of like how I see it. Um, it's to me, tequila and Mezcal are not that different from say like, Bayside single malts and Isla single malts. They're all malt whiskeys from Scotland, but different production practices and traditions have sort of led them to very different flavor profiles. Um, and there are people who like that range, and there are some people who only like one or the other. And so that's sort of how I kind of view what's going on in Mexico. So with the with the agave spirits there. Yeah, I really love the technological distinction you make and and it kind of maps on with I guess what was happening in other spirits industries and and maybe even just in in food in general as we've been able to go from, you know, pre-industrial to industrial to post-industrial or the, the technological side right. of food and beverage because, you know, around that time that tequila split off from mezcal, we were making other technological advancements that made food more palatable, uh, less agri not less agricultural, but I guess more or differently or more intensely processed or processed yeah. in a way that, that kind of smoothed out some of the rough edges. And now it's almost like we've crossed over, crossed back over infinity and, and everyone's nerding out on the, the ru rustic mezcal stuff. I mean, if you listen to, to anything about, uh, Delmagay, uh, and their single village stuff, you know, you'll, you'll hear them just gushing over, you know, the clay pot still that they're using or the, the family lineage of these farmers and going back four or five generations. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's, yeah, I think that technological manner of, of viewing these two spirits is really useful as well as what you said about the space side versus the, the Isla. Is it, is it a sherry bomb? Is it a salt bomb? You know, what, what do you, what, right. what kind of, flavor are you looking for and are you willing 
willing to be able to, you know, hold both of these in your hands and appreciate the qualities of each. So, um, I guess the last question I really wanted to ask you in the main interview portion here pertains, as I mentioned, to, to current trends and emerging trends in the agave world. Um, obviously, we've mentioned that, you know, mezcal uh, and agave spirits in general hold this kind of special allure in the American market, and we are the biggest market, it seems. So yeah. what are we looking at right now, and, and what, what can we see emerging as uh, the next couple of years occur? So I think, you know, the, the trend right now is more, uh, more tequila, more mezcal, more and more. And so what that means is like, so consumption for agave spirits, for tequila and mezcal are growing. So what that people are interested in, in the spirits. And so what we're seeing is a, a shift in tequila consumption from what I and others refer to as mixto tequilas, which are tequilas that are are made from 51% agave uh, sugars and 49% sugars from other sources, usually sugarcane, that are co-fermented and then distilled. So that's usually referred to as a mixto. So like Jose Cuervo Gold is like your quintessential mixto tequila. Lots of people have lots of stories about bad choices uh, in college about drinking too much bad tequila. And that's usually what they're sort of referring to these like mixtos that are very, you know, cheap in terms of a uh, uh, price point. So people are moving their dollars away from those lower price point mixto tequilas towards the uh, higher price point, hundred percent agave tequilas. They like people are liking the flavor of hundred percent agave spirits. And and so they're putting their dollars into tequilas, into mezcals, and even now things like Bacanora and Ricea, which are much smaller categories of agave spirits made in Mexico that have their own traditions. And and that's where they're going. And so there's because that's where people dollars are going, there's there's a growing number of brands trying to capture some of those dollars. So we're going to see a lot more uh, tequila brands coming into the market as well as a lot more mezcal brands. And the categories of Bacanora, Ricea, and even Sotol, which isn't technically an agave spirit, but it's sort of related spiritually to it. They're sort of like a cousin. Those categories will also grow. And I think we're going to start seeing those become more sort of mainstream terms that people, not just agave nerds know, but more common uh, mainstream drinkers will start to learn about these other spirits as well, that they'll make their way into, into more of your everyday bars and not just the, the more uh, exclusive or fancy sort of craft cocktail bars. So that's sort of what I think is going to be going on for the next few years. More brands, um, more choice, but because of like going back to what I said earlier about how we have lots of brands with fewer number of producers, there's, there's going to be a, um, it also means that there'll be a lot of overlap in terms of sort of flavor profiles and it'll take some work by the consumer to sort of figure out what it is they like, where it's coming from, if they're interested in that information and, and sort of really finding the best deals for them. So I, I'm excited by it. I think agave spirits are a fantastic uh, product. I love drinking them. In general, I'm, I'm happy to see this growth because I think agave spirits are, you know, deserve a sort of seat in the pantheon of great spirits alongside whiskey and rum and brandies. And, and, uh, it's starting to get there. Yeah, for sure. And I, I like, the opportunity that that presents for home consumers. You and I are kind of industry dudes. We we talk yeah. with people who make this stuff, but really the listeners of this podcast in many cases are, are home enthusiasts and home consumers. And as you were kind of describing those trends, it occurred to me that one of the big opportunities that people who are listening to this episode right now um, can can take advantage of is the fact that they know this is coming now and, and you, you so if you're a home consumer, 
um, you know, you have the opportunity to start influencing those trends. If you too are also excited about what agave can be, if you too also want to see less mixtos and more 100% agave and more agave varietals on the shelves, then the best thing, in my opinion, that you can do is to, you know, use resources like the Tequila Dictionary, like this podcast, like the kind of three-part series we've done at this point on agave and American agave, um, and and try to bring that knowledge to your friends. Uh, little by little, you know, hey, this is a Bacanora. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, a single village mezcal. Uh, here's a little bit of info on this village. You know, th- these are little things that you can do as a home consumer uh, to kind of back people into this category so that we can, you know, see more of those dollars on the production side being focused where you want them. So it's it's a voting with your with your lips and it's a voting with your wallet type of thing, which is very easy to do as a consumer. So my kind of ask for our listeners is to take the lead on that because just by listening to this podcast or by picking up a, a copy of the Tequila Dictionary, this is something you can kind of be empowered to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So I'd like to transition to some lightning round questions here. And our first lightning round question is, is about cocktails. So as, as a little transition, I guess, what do you think about tequila and mezcal cocktails? Um, like, is, like, what do you see, I guess, trending in the industry right now? And then we can talk about what your favorites are. Yeah. So I think, um, so for quite a while, you would only really find cocktails using tequila. And then slowly mezcal started to make some inroads, but only like, you know, the the lowest cost uh, mezcals on the market were making their way into, into some cocktails. But now I think what's really interesting is because people are really focused on flavor for cocktail innovation, that uh, they are experimenting with different types of uh, tequilas, different brands of mezcal, and, but then also bringing in um, Bacanora and Ricea and Sotol into these cocktails because they're of their focus on flavor, not just price point, which is, I think, which is fun. So obviously, if you're going to have a sort of higher cost base spirit in your drink, you know, that, that means you're going to be paying and, you know, a twelve, fourteen dollar, you know, price for your cocktail, depending on where you are in the country. But, but people are doing some really innovative things around flavor and pairing agave spirits with um, amaros and with liqueurs and other spirits that are that are very different. But somehow they find a way to to work together. I'm I'm really impressed with the current sort of sort of batch of cocktail creators that we have at present in the US and how creative they're being with flavor combinations, things that I would never think of. I mean, in the same way chefs come up with recipes, right? And and kind of pair flavors and herbs and foods together that make delicious things that we eat. We say to sort of take that for granted, but now I we're seeing more and more of that in the cocktail world. There's just some really fantastic stuff happening. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and one other detail that has recently occurred to me on that front, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, the 12, 14, you know, if you're in D.C. or San Francisco or New York, you can be paying upwards of that for a single right. cocktail. The interesting thing to me is that when you're paying more for the base spirit, you know, if, if you're doing it right and if it's being sourced correctly by these bartenders whose job it is to really evaluate these things and put them through their paces before they place them on a menu. If you're paying more for that high quality base spirit, what's happening is that more complexity, more nuance is being baked in at the ground floor. And so sometimes it's also really fun to take these craft agave spirits and also use them in very simple cocktails, like an old fashioned, like a very simple margarita. And, you know, that that's a way to kind of, yeah, control your cost by a couple bucks, right? You're not throwing in an expensive Amaro on top of your expensive tequila, but it also helps you appreciate the nuance that 
kind of led the bottle to be that price in the first place. So um, yeah. it, 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 it's a nice opportunity. I think it's something that people, they want to go zero to 60. They want to go craft craft tequila all the way to, you know, up to a craft tomorrow and throw in some chartreuse while we're at it. But a missed opportunity sometimes is to, to, to check out some of those classic, very simple cocktails. Um, and it's a, it's a good price regulator and it, it just teaches you so, so much about the spirit. Mm-hmm. One of the very popular cocktails in Oaxaca while we were living there is a mezcal Negroni. The real mezcal works fantastically with Campari and sweet vermouth. It just it makes a fantastic drink that's very different from your sort of standard Negroni with gin. And that's just something really simple that you know anybody can make at home and uh, has a, a real nice variation on a classic. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So what's your favorite cocktail? It doesn't have to be an agave cocktail, but it certainly can be. Um, if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something maybe you've more recently fallen in love with? I would say my favorite cocktail is probably the Manhattan with bourbon. I really like that. I mean, I, I like lots of cocktails. Gin, a good gin martini is fantastic. A good, you know, margarita, obviously. I really like tiki drinks, but, you know, a part of it is the simplicity of it. You know, bourbon, sweet vermouth, and some bitters. And it's just, uh, to me, it, it's, it's really fa- a fantastic drink. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, you know, I find that uh, often the people who are responsible for uh, running the greatest number of spirits over their palates uh, for a job tend to really gravitate toward those really simple drinks. It's almost <laughs> like, a, okay, we're done. Let's just have one of these nice, simple yeah. classics. I I appreciate complex cocktails, um, but at home, I am not a I am not a mixologist. So three drink cocktails at home is about the limit of my my ability, and so the Manhattan fits nicely into my wheelhouse at home and I, even when you're out like it's hard to mess up a, a Manhattan when even you know you're at a, a bar that may maybe doesn't have the sort of best selection of, of drinks on the menu so for sure for sure so here's one of our other lightning round questions that people really enjoy if you were a cocktail ingredient what would you be and why Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I thought about this and I would probably have to say some sort of Amaro because I find myself, I feel like I am a very sort of personable person when I'm with people that I know and, and easy to relate to. And there is an aspect of me that can be a bit standoffish and closed to uh, certain situations and outsiders are like, "Mm, I don't need to really interact with you a whole lot. So I'm just going to keep my distance. And um, so anyway, I think so that combination of of somewhat bitter, somewhat sweet, I think sort of fits my personality. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Um, man, I I love I love that answer. And but the you know, the other thing about Amari is that there there's also that kind of complexity baked in. Right. And yeah. and uh, I think you need to have that openness to complexity to be able to effectively, you know, run a, you know, judging of craft spirits like you do uh, year after year. And, and so, you know, that's what I also key in on uh, from from that and also from your personality. Yeah. So if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint us a picture. Yeah, this is. Again, this is a really fascinating question. I mean, so I think the obvious, there's two obvious answers, is I I would love to sit at the bar in Martinez with uh, Jerry Thomas, right? Just sit at that bar and drink, and or in San Francisco. And the other answer would be maybe sitting and drinking whiskey with, Oh, now I'm blanking on his name. The the writer of Tom Sawyer and oh, Mark Huckleberry Twain, very Finn and Mark Twain. Yeah, I, I can't know, know why I forgot. Like those two guys are just sort of icons of. So I was a history student of 19th century 18, uh, in America, and so like 
that sort of time period and those characters are really sort of fascinating to me, both on sort of like a drinks and literary side. And so like that, that would be sort of, those would be sort of the people that I'd be really interested to have a drink with. There are lots of other people that would be fun to have a drink with um, and talk with, but I think those two guys would be fun to drink with. For sure. Jerry Thomas, the professor, the author of one of the first uh, published cocktail manuals. And then uh, Mark Twain, there's there's a if you want to have like a really bizarre kind of experience pertaining to Mark Twain, look up a picture of him. I think if I'm recalling this correctly, he's holding like a Colt 1911, which is like a like a modern pistol. Mm -hmm. And, and it's funny because he lived into the 1900s and, uh, but it's just, it's very weird for us to think of Mark Twain who, who wrote in, in the late 1800s. We, we see him as this almost like kind of old West riverboat right. character, but this picture has him holding like a very modern looking firearm. So it's just a, it's a weird thing. Kind of like, uh, it gives you like a weird little, uh, uncanny jolt when you look at it. So check that mm. out. Oh, well. So. Obviously, we've been talking about your book on tequila today, but are there any other books about tequila that have been particularly influential or enjoyable for you? That is a really good question. So there, there's sort of a, a lack of high-quality books, I would say, on tequila right now. There's been an explosion in great books recently on mezcal. So there, there, there's like four or five, I would say. If you're interested in learning more about Mezcal in particular, uh, there, there's quite a few new books out on Mezcal that are great. But tequila has for a long time just been sort of treated as this sort of party spirit. And as such, there wasn't a, I read through quite a few books about tequila and there's just not a lot that's really great out there specifically about it. There's there are some books which I think are decent um, that focus in more about sort of production and sort of history of the product, but uh, not so much one that sort of hones in on the spirits themselves and flavors and things like that. There are lots of whiskey books and out in the world where you can get, you know, tasting notes and things like that. There's not a lot like that in in the tequila world right now. So that's partly why I think this book has a, a great place in in on the shelves right now uh, for for fans of the spirit, because there's sort of been a, a, a gap in in this uh, in in the literature around tequila and there's been this giant boom in mezcal writing recently. So I think it, the book is really uh, coming out at a, a right time for people. Right. And I think that a, a reference style book is a great place to start, right? It kind of yeah. sets the stage for things that follow. And it's something that can also be used in conjunction with, uh, you know, any future books that are published. Um, so I, I think that you, you're kind of doing a, a really nice thing for the that literary space in general, and you know, it's it's a uh, it's it's almost like a, a catalyst. So um, yeah, for sure, we'll give you uh, in just a moment an opportunity to tell folks where they can get this book and how to connect with you. But one last question before we sign off here is: it, Do you have any advice for somebody who's just starting to learn about or experiment with tequila at home? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, the the way I think the best way to learn about spirits is to taste them. And so in my experience, uh, the easiest way to do that is find a bar where they have a good selection of tequilas and maybe mezcals and go in and talk to them about, you know, what you're interested in and try start tasting some stuff. And then, you know, use resources that you can find online or in my book to sort of understand what what it is you're drinking. And that's, I think, the best way to kind of to, to build your knowledge about tequila um, is to, to start drinking it and and to just go from there. So the reason why I like bars is because you can, you know, you can sample drinks by, you know, sample bottles by the drink 
rather than committing to a full bottle, not knowing what it tastes like. And so that's that's why I like that method. For sure. Right. And, you know, there's in, in major metropolitan areas, you're going to have great opportunities. You, you really can't, you know, have a big metro area without some sort of bar that specializes in this. Um, yeah. So I'll link to a few in the show notes page for this episode over at modernbarcart.com. And, you know, if you happen to be in one of those large metro areas, great. Definitely hit those places. They're vetted. They're well regarded. Um, but uh, if you're somebody who lives in maybe a little bit more of a rural area and you, you have a resource that you want us to slap on this page um, for, for folks in your area, please do hit us up on social media at Modern Bar Cart. Give us a shout and I'll be happy to edit that into the show notes page at any point. We like to have this as a, as a kind of continuing resource for folks uh, so that it's evergreen content and it, it remains useful. So please reach out to us if you would like to uh, give a give a little bump for your local joint where they do great work with these agave spirits. So Eric, now it is time for the listing of places where, where you would recommend folks picking up this fine publication. Where would, where will you send folks? Yeah. So if you want to buy the book, I mean, obviously any online retailer like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or target even carries it online. Um, Obviously, brick and mortar stores will also carry it. So if you have a, a favorite bookstore that's close to you, um, go. you can find it there. And if they don't have it, you can ask them to order it for you. Uh, it's carried by, you know, all the major book distributors. So it can it can be in any local bookstore um, that, that you need it at. So you can find it online or, or in your local shop. Fantastic. And if somebody wants to reach out to you digitally uh, or via email, you don't have to list your email if you don't want to. Um, but what's the best way to get in touch with you remotely if they have questions? My email is eric at easydrinking.com. That's my my website is easy, like my initials, eric zandona, uh, drinking.com. And so my email is just eric at e easy drinking. So I can be reached there. Um, you, people are free to you know, check out my website. And, uh, and then I can also be found on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at Easy Drinking. Very good. Well, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, for all of you listening at home, please, if, if this sounded like an interesting conversation to you, the Tequila Dictionary has a lot, a lot, a lot more in it. So check it out online and we will catch you next time here on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Cheers. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, encyclopedic tequila and mezcal knowledge courtesy of Eric Zandona, and a little bit 
of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.